knows even why some houses are called haunted. What would you call this place? Well, diseased, sick, crazy. Such houses are described in the Bible as lifts. Before that, it was raised for the underworld. A house of demons. Hi everybody, this is Paranormal UK Radio, the flagship show of the Paranormal UK Radio Network. I'm your host, Irene Allen Block, and I'm here tonight with my co-host, or should I say host of the show tonight, because I'm not feeling too good, Mark Johnson. Hello. Yeah, you're, I'm sorry to hear about uh, your little accident. My broken ribs. <laughs> Yes, and oh, as I someone shouldn't laugh, don't make me laugh, Mark. Well, it hurts. As, as someone who once had an upper respiratory infection and who coughed so hard he cracked a couple of ribs, I completely Never. sympathize with the pain you're in. Never, you did that. Oh my God, yes. When I first moved to New Jersey from California twenty years ago, I had a really severe upper respiratory infection, and I coughed so, kept coughing so hard. And at one point, I coughed, and I heard a crack, and then I was in <gasps> agony. Oh my gosh! You know, I've had this now what two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, it really became bad when I came back from Venice. By the way, Venice. Everybody, yes. everybody should go to Venice. It's absolutely fantastic. It's we, like stepping back in history, Mark. I, I wanted to ask you how your trip went. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant, and it's handbag heaven out there. Literally handbag heaven. So Venice, I advise everybody that can, please go to Venice because you know. It, it, it is. It's really like stepping back into the medieval times. Fantastic. The only thing that, yeah, the only thing that ruins it is everybody standing around, all the tourists and everything, because there's hundreds of thousands of tourists go there every day, taking selfies of themselves, especially in St. Mark's Square. Hmm. Uh, but otherwise, nothing's changed. Nothing has changed. The little... The little alleyways and the canals, gondolas uh, selling themselves on the bridges, trying to get you to go in their boats. You know, it's absolutely fantastic. It was just like being back in the medieval, well, being in the medieval times. It really was. The buildings are fantastic. The architecture is fantastic. The food is fantastic, although expensive. The drinks are fantastic. Don't drink coffee in St. Mark's Square. It'll cost you about £25 a cup. Oh, my but God. But otherwise, yeah, uh, 25 euros a cup. Otherwise, you know, it's fantastic. Wow. Absolutely great. Well, that's so. definitely on my bucket list, one of the places yes. we want to go visit. Yes, and I'm going back again as well. <laughs> Well, I wanted to say uh, it, it is good having you back. I know you missed the last couple of shows. Christian uh, Delaney sat in uh, in your absence. Yeah. He did a wonderful job. I know. I heard. I heard. I listened to the shows. They were very, very good. So, And I uh, talked about shows, Mark. Would you like to say it? No, I'll let you do the honors. Well, now on the network, we've taken on the ADX files with Alison Dallinock. From Scotland, Glasgow, in fact. So we have, that's our uh, second Scottish show. Yeah, second Scottish show, which after, is great. After Weirder Hings, but Alison Dunlitz show, The ADX Files, um, uh, is mm -hmm. going to be uh, coming out every, uh, every Saturday, yes. roughly, she will be sending over a show. So we will have it on the network, and we'll also have it on our Podbean, Stitcher, iTunes for downloading on demand. That's right. And everywhere else. Everywhere else, people. Yep. So, okay. Al Allison, welcome to the network. Yeah. <laughs> She's lovely. Or to Absolutely the loony bin, lovely. as I say. Well, that's true. Yep. That is true. Right. I mustn't laugh because every time I laugh, I'm in absolute agony here. So, <laughs> do you want to introduce the guest? Well, first of all, Mark, what's been happening with you? Um, not much. Just working, working, more working. Yeah. All work and no play make Mark a dull boy. Well, he always was, wasn't he? Yes, he was. <laughs> I can't deny it. Oh, oh, no, you're not a dull boy. But what's the weather like there? Uh, you know, pick a day. 
Uh, fall is here a couple of weeks early. It's been suddenly cold and overcast, and the, most of our leaves are gone already. Normally, the- do you know something? You're talking about that. Your leaves have gone. Our leaves are still on the tree. They're just, I was looking at my trees in the drive. They're just uh, a few leaves here and there in the trees starting to turn brown. See, but otherwise, I, they're still beautiful, green, vibrant trees. So I'm, I'm convinced we're in for a hard winter because this, this fall came too quick, too early, and uh, you know whether you want to blame it on climate change or whatever, um, it's definitely not normal. And uh, I think it's going to be pretty cold, so I'm getting a lot of firewood ready for the winter. Uh, stocking up, yes. <clears throat> oh yes, definitely. Even uh, if I'll clear my throat a little bit, I'll I'll mute as much as I can because this weather changing so much has got me all a little congested. So, but as we say, <laughs> so we're both we're both a couple of poor souls. Then me, ah, uh, we'll survive. It it yeah. just gives me that you know that sexy raspy voice. Wow. Raspy, yes. Yep. Yes. <laughs> and we'll leave it at that. Um, so shall we introduce our guest? Well, you can, yeah. Okay, I will. <laughs> um, okay, you do that. We have a very interesting guest coming to us all the way from France. Uh, Paris. Paris. He, he is a, <laughs> uh, an alien and UFO experiencer. And um, he is also a coach and bioenergy healer. And we want to welcome Jesse Cranu to the program. How are you tonight, Jesse? Hi, Mark. Hi, Irene. Hi, everybody. It's great to be on the show. It's uh, raining in Paris, too, but we have a little bit of sunshine in edge in edge ways, and then the rain comes back, the sun comes back, so it's not too, too oh, bad. It's a, it's a pretty je- mild autumn so far. But Jesse, Jesse, don't worry about it. Today it's been wind and rain here, and it's all heading your way for the, the next few days. Well, we're you know, I'll tell you, it, we're sending it over. We're sending it over. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you a secret, Irene. I love walking in the rain. I have this great big golfing umbrella, and I walk and I just listen to the sound of the rain. And it's but so do you relaxing. dance? Do you dance in the rain? Do you do a Frank Sinatra? I, I used to dance, yes, before I broke my back, but that was a long time ago. Now I was supposed to be an artist on stage, but that's I've gone now. Oh, never mind. But well, yeah, I have another life. <laughs> I tell you, I tell you what I like. I like the smell of the rain. Yeah, it's great. That's, yeah, that smell when it gets on the grass and everything. It is absolutely a beautiful smell. Uh, yeah, and you know, you can feel that that smell coming up from the earth. You know, it's really, yeah. really rich. Mm. Yeah, it's very good. I love it. I love it. Uh, I don't know whether they have that in America, but smelly rain. No, they wouldn't. They wouldn't dare. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know how us Americans like to take everything and claim it as our own, so. Oh, Oh, well. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Whatever. whatever. (laughs) Yeah, I can bash my own own culture over here. (laughs) It's... uh, Of course. Things things are kind of crazy for now, but I will tell you... He bashes it and I bash it, too. Yeah. No good. <laughs> then I put then I put the British in their place too. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to be counting points here. You watch out, you two. Uh, well, well, Jesse, I will say that I, I've never been to, to Paris or France. That's definitely another one that's on my bucket list. Oh, absolutely oh, yeah, beautiful! Well, absolutely yes, beautiful, isn't must. it, Jesse? Oh yes, it is the place to be. Forget Venice, Irene. Oh, Paris oh, is the I place. I don't know. I've been. <laughs> I, I love Venice, but I also love Paris. I've been to Paris very many, many times, and you know it's just absolutely magical. Uh, Paris is great, my, and and coffee is much cheaper than under the Saint Saint Mark Square. <laughs> <laughs> I remember years and years ago us over here moaning about the price of coffee in France. You know about yeah, oh, yeah. that was forty years ago. We were mm-hmm. moaning about the price of coffee in France, and um, but compared with St. Mark's Square, you know, 25, yeah, like- 25 euros to have a cup of coffee in St. Mark's Square, and you get charged service charge also if you sit down at a table in St. Mark's Square, and if they're playing music at the bandstand, you get even more charges put on. 
No, oh, well, you can't stop the Italians, can you? <laughs> <laughs> so well, the place to the place to have coffee is in the back streets of Venice, you know, in the little squares and places like that, or the little cafes by the canals. Absolutely. Off the beaten fantastic. track. Yes, yes, and it's mm. a lot better because you haven't got so many tourists and it's more Italian, more Italian. So, you know, Certainly. Abs- yeah, and a better price. Well, Jesse, we've had you on the program because you have a very interesting background and I want to talk to you. Let, let's start at the very beginning. If you could tell people a little bit about yourself and uh, what you've been experiencing uh, all your life. Okay, I will do that. But if you think you're, we're only down for one show, you better think again because I've got a <laughs> lot to tell you. <laughs> I th- I've I really think, got a lot to tell you. I yes, think I this really. whole show. I think this whole show would be taken up, Jesse, with you telling <laughs> us your story. Well. And we'll do the interview in the next show. (laughs) Okay, okay. We'll see how we manage, shall we? Okay. Right. uh, Where shall I start? Because it's really complicated. I'm going to be 59 in a couple of weeks, so I'm not a spring chicken. I've been experiencing contacts, encounters, meetings, travels, uh, I've been followed uh, with and by aliens from all sorts of places, all sorts of dimensions, all my life. It started as far as I can remember in this life, because I've also regressed into pa- many past lives. Oh, in we're going to have life, fun talking about that then. Yeah, we'll have to talk about that. And uh, But in this life, it started when I was two, so I was really, really very little. And, um, and I was really scared because... I was in my bed, it was night time, it was bedtime, I was supposed to go to sleep. I was always somebody who lives by night, so it was really, really difficult for me to fall asleep as much as my parents wanted me to, but then I had to go. And there I was in bed and I could feel, there are many, many ways I channel and um, I can contact and interact with aliens. One of them is waves. I can feel waves. Imagine like you're in, in, a, in a swimming pool, there's nobody there, and you can feel the water all around you. Your, your eyes are closed, you're just there floating. And suddenly, um, still with your eyes closed, you can feel somebody sneaking in at the other end of the swimming pool. Small little wavelets are coming to you. This is how I feel many of my contacts and communications a lot of the time. Other times I see people, we interact a lot during the night. That's probably why I was a night bird, because a lot of them come during the night. They come every night. They keep me awake. They wake me up. They work when I'm awake. They work through my sleep. They induce dreams to me. And uh, we have a lot of fun, really. <laughs> and uh, I've learned a lot through them. Most of them are um, really, really nice and kind and helpful. I must also say at this stage that I'm a hybrid. I'm going, I should be um, appearing in a book that's going to come out uh, that is already out in English. But um, that should be coming out in French and in a uh, new edition in English hopefully including me, because uh, this is a book about hybrids. Uh, what's the, what hybrid is the name book. of the book in, uh, in at English? At the moment, the actual version is called Meet the Hybrids. Meet the Hybrids, okay. Yes, uh, one of the guys is called, who wrote it is called Miguel Mendonça, and oh, I hope I get her name wrong. I think the, the lady who works with him is Barbara Lamb. I think that's what her name is. I haven't got it uh, handy here, so I cannot really tell you. But you should find it on the internet. It's on sale. It's been on sale for some time. Okay. Except I'm not. I, except I'm not in that version. If the authors agree to to have me, but that's still in the, you know, in all the kerfuffle and processes of being negotiated. Uh, there's going to be a French version of that too, and uh, in which, of course, I should be appearing too. Now, what I mean by being a hybrid is. I have a quarter of me is human, and three different quarters of me are hybrid with alien races from different systems, different planets. I speak alien languages. I also write another alien language, 
and I also sign, you know, I think sign language, another alien language. And um, uh, I think they taught me Spanish because I, I, I learned 13 Earth languages, but the Spanish being one of them, except Spanish, I never learned it. I woke up one day and I spoke Spanish. Huh. Wow. Uh, start. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, well, well. Let me let me ask you this, Jesse. You 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 yeah. say you're you're a hybrid of three alien races. What can you tell mm-hmm. us? What which alien races that you're referring to? The most uh, I would say presence maybe or alive in me is Humo. Have you heard of Planet Humo? No, I can't say that I have. U double M O. People there are called sometimes you might, sometimes human. So that's right, capital U, double M A N S. And um, they've been corresponding with people from Earth also very actively, mostly in France and Spain, Spain even before France, then France, through writing. In fact, they send me papers virtual papers. I have lots of papers, documents coming, like they're coming out of a photocopier. And they come and come and come and come and come and I read them really, really fast. I can slow them down. I can see what they're talking about. I must say I have never been happy living on Earth as a human. It's always been hell for me. I've really had to conform to a human system when I have to work and etc. My house is not at all decorated nor designed. Uh, my flat, I should say, um, like any earthly uh, house or flat, my furniture is not the same nor in the same place. Um, I eat differently from different people. I think differently. I can do things in different languages. Actually, I'm talking to you in English now. I'm playing Scrabble in French on my tablet. <laughs> and I can do different things in different languages. That is typically human. Uh, humid, sorry. And um, lots of things like that. It irritates people around me sometimes when I'm multitasking like this. And uh, they don't know who I'm really talking to because I can address three or four people at the same time. I um, ah. uh, am. Je- yes, Jesse, Jesse, going yeah. back to they communicate to you in writing. This is the oh. people from the planet of Umos? Yes? Umos. U M O, yeah, Umo. Umo. yeah. They do. Yeah. The others use different systems. Do do they also communicate to you in writing through computers? No, they don't. But I have oh, I have many talents, Irene. One of them is upsetting computers and telephone networks. Let's hope it doesn't happen during our show tonight. Mm-hmm. And um, yes, I get really, really strange things with telephones, the calls, messages. I never send with the mail, with the email. Sometimes when I get annoyed or frustrated, all my computers, I don't know why, stop to work. And at the beginning, I thought it was me, but no, 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 it's not me. I've had proof of that. And uh, many, many ways, some of them are communicate in their own language or in our own common language, which are non-earthly languages. And uh, it just depends. I I just have so many. um, I've met people from an entities, material and immaterial entities, from 20 or 25 different kinds and uh, origins so Mm, far. And new ones are coming in all the time. Yeah, Jesse, I'm trying to understand this. How do you eat differently? Well, first, I'm a vegetarian. I've been a vegetarian Uh, most of my life. And I eat at different times. I go to bed at different times. I wake up at different times. I've tried changing that. I've done every exercise under the sun. Uh, Mm. I have all those dreams, and I, I never stop. I mean... It's easier, actually, if you ask me the questions and then I can answer and take it from there. Yeah. Mark? Sorry, I had to mute while I was coughing there. Um, <laughs> well, well, Jesse, the, these these alien races, you mentioned the one, Uman. Um, it, for people who are familiar or at least have some familiarity with... Um, different alien races that are visiting Earth and interacting. And we've had a chance to interview a lot of people who have had experiences. I mean, these uh, 
these uh, extraterrestrials, what would you say they look like? Do they look like humans? Do they look like, I mean, there's everything people have described from the greys to the Nordic like humans to reptilians to good God knows what. So I'm curious uh, if you could describe the, the three races that you're mostly involved with. Of course. Uh, first, I am a reptilian also. In fact, I have many past lives in different reptilians. My uh, totem animal is a reptilian. It's a crocodile. Um, I, um, I was, I once had, I have a few friends who actually can go back and contact aliens through channeling. They can read souls. They can read DNA. My DNA is partly uh, extraterrestrial too. And one of them recently, three of them came to, to confirm all this. And one of them recently, she said, Jesse, my God, I've never seen anybody like you. She reads lives and karma and etc. And she said, I've never seen anybody like you. Your incarnation go back, go back to prehistoric times and you were a reptile and a reptilian after that. I said, I know I've been a reptilian many times, a good reptilian every time. And um, what was your question again? What do they look like? Yes, okay. Uh, they look like all sorts of things and all sorts of animals, even that are on Earth. Uh, a lot of them are humanoids, not all of them. Some of them are material, others are immaterial, which means they are being beings, sorry, of light or of gas. They come from gas planets or light planets. Um, they often project themselves to humans, not all of them, not the greys. There are many types of greys. In fact, there are tall greys. There are re what I call regular sized greys. There are smaller greys. There are what I call greens, which is greys, but which are actually green. And there are also white who are uh, greys, but actually white, a different color. Uh, they basically all do the same job to the best of my knowledge. What do they look like? A lot of them can also, um, a lot of them just channel. Uh, maybe you've heard in the States of Barbara Marciniak who channels for the Pleiadians. Uh, they just work through channels and channeling. Uh, some of them give themselves uh, a friendly appearance. Let me give you an example here. Uh, I've seen a lot of them of all sorts of shapes and kinds and sizes. Uh, I have a nephew, my wife is Iranian, I have a nephew in Tehran who is 15 years old, all his life, as far back as he can remember when he was a baby, he's been meeting every night an alien. And uh, this alien appears to him as a griffin. And one day he asked me, he said, uncle, he said, uh, what is this alien? Does he really look like a griffin? I said, no, he doesn't look like a griffin. And so he said, what does he look like? I said, well, let me tell you something. And why does he appear as a griffin? I said, well, you know, he's appearing to you as a griffin because you are Iranian. And griffin is part of Persian history and symbols and mythology. So he means to appear friendly and um, not to scare you off by taking on this appearance. And then I said to him, I said, okay, but what language do you speak with him every night? Because... I was curious because I meet one of them too. So he says, I said, do you speak um, Farsi, which is Iranian, or do you speak his language? He said, oh, we speak his language. So I said, so he taught you his language? He says, yes. And I, I asked him, can you tell me something in that language? He says, no, when I'm awake, in fact, I cannot really speak that language. I said, I know, because I have the same thing. There are the alien languages when we're awake. We cannot really speak them. Don't ask me why. It just happens like this or not very well. Although I can speak them more and more and my channeling is expanding. So I understand and I can speak more and more languages of their planets and systems. So um, I said, okay, well, do you think you could give me a few words or a few sounds of that language? And then he starts talking. And I think, oh, my God, I speak that language too. And I said, so, okay, so we meet the same alien. And he says, okay, can you... Uh, can you tell me if he really looks like a griffin? I said, no, I can confirm he doesn't look like a griffin at all. He's not even humanoid. Uh, some of them I have, meet, I have met, sorry, are um, octop octopuses, octopi. And, uh, but they are what I call dry octopi because they don't need to live in water. 
some of them are um, different animals. Some of them are mixtures of humans and animals. They may be humanoid. Some of them are insectoid. The one who followed me from when I was a little boy, a really little boy, is actually um, an insectoid. He's a bit like a, a big cicada, if you see what they're like. And they are actually teachers, and they're really good. They're full of love. They're really great. I realized, uh, of course, much after that growing up, that, um, in fact, uh, he was really friendly and full of love. He was pretty harmless. And he's actually taught me many, many things. Uh, some of them are a bit like, you know, Greek gods, the Santor and all these. And they, in fact, created life, most of life on Earth. And so... They created life in their image. Whales exist on other planets. Mermaids exist on other planets. Horse-like uh, humanoids exist on other planets. Feline humanoids, lots of them. Birds-like, lots of them. Really, really lots of them. So, so if I if I understood you correctly, that they did they create human beings here on this planet? Oh, they did the reptilians mostly. Yes, the reptilians are actually great geneticians. They're really, really uh, super uh, genetical engineers, and they're really, really great. They're also very good with technology. No, they're not the only ones. A lot of them um, interfere every now and then. Yeah. Well, I, I know yeah. that uh, Zachariah Stitchin, who wrote many, many books, uh, starting with The Twelfth Planet, uh, are you familiar yeah. with Zachariah Stitchin? Yeah, a little. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've got some of these books. I've read some of these. Yeah, books. yeah. He tr he translated a lot of the old um, Sumerian texts and that talked about the Anunnaki, uh, which was an alien race that created the human race, and they were a reptilian type of race, creating That's humans. Right. Now, now, it, for most people that are into ufology and ufos and and aliens the reptilians usually get a pretty bad rap you, usually you don't hear very many uh positive experiences about reptilians they, they do i agree and i'm really sorry about that because maybe some of them are bad but i know quite a few of them and they're actually quite good and uh, i actually have no other humans who are hybrids and who are also reptilians and they are really nice the lady i was talking to um i was talking about a moment ago who told me about my prehistoric life she's also a reptilian from another planet originally and she's a hybrid uh yes there is somebody but i don't think uh, i don't think he speaks english actually that guy i'm going to tell you about his name is anton park he's half french half german He's written many, many books, and he's actually revised and corrected a lot of the work of um, Zachariah Sitchin. Um, he channels, they channel through to him, actually, Sumerians, Anunnaki, and all of them. He's a great guy, he's really a great guy, but I don't think he speaks English. I'm going to do a show with him uh, myself in French. He's done a show in French with his wife, who also channels. And, um, yeah, but... Um, did I answer your question or not? <laughs> in a roundabout <laughs> way, yes. I mean, um, you know, there's, in general, again, like I said, the reptilians generally get a bad rap, or you hear you hear a lot more negative stories about reptilians. But then there's also a lot of very negative stories about the greys too, uh, or what people. Per, uh, call the greys usually the greys and reptilians get the bad rap you get the um the nordics or the human like ones that are supposed to be good but you know i i personally look at all classifications of good and bad uh i i i think that we're 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 too quick to judge and classify because just because somebody has an experience that might be unpleasant doesn't necessarily mean that they're dealing with something bad or evil Exactly. Now, I would like to say something here that is that, uh, as I just said a moment ago, you know, a lot of them are actually good. The greys, in fact, most of them are just like robots. You know, they're, they're just um, bionic, organic, I should say, robots. Uh, they just carry out tasks for other people. For romantoids, have you heard of the mantoids? Mantoid, or oh, the mantis beings? Yes. The prey, yeah, they're also called the mantoids, the praying mantis. 
they also get a bad rap, but I, I know some of them, and they're quite nice. Uh, they can come in all sizes. They can be quite impressive. I saw one, which is uh, about 30 meters. That's about 90 feet. Okay. Uh, for the others who want to know more um, about reptilians, I had a show uh, about that a couple of weeks ago. They only have to learn French, and then they can watch it on the internet. <laughs> but I'm going to do more and more uh, shows in English, even um, sometimes some presentations uh, besides other shows, to to get a message. Because part of my mission here on Earth is also to to educate and inform people and help people. So, yes, they get a bad rap, but um, Mark, I would like to say one thing, Mark and Irene, of course, I would like to say one thing here. That is, you know, a lot of people read a lot of things on the Internet, which they interpret. Uh, sometimes they don't even understand. Sometimes they don't check their facts. I mean, I correct a lot of people on the Internet, too, because they tell a lot of nonsense. They repeat things. It's just hearsay, you know, they just repeat hearsay. They don't even think for themselves. We, we I mean, people like me, uh, Anton Parks and, um, and people like us, we have a lot of hard work because we get a bad rap because people tell us we're crazy or this or that. We get a bad rap because we talk about things people don't understand. One of the guys the other day, I was on a French radio, and this guy, he commented on the Internet, he said, oh, that's easy, you talk about this, that, and guy, and what sort of material proof do you have? I said, I have a material truth. It's in the eight dimension. Why don't you come and have a look? The guy never answered, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> never having had a uh, experience myself, although I could be, I will be honest, not one that I can remember anyway. <clears throat> um, it, yeah, yeah, so never catch a little fish. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the whole thing because a lot of people who have. Uh, these uh, experiences, they don't remember it or they have screen memories uh, and they go through hypnotic That's regression right. to learn more about it. Now, you know, were you, did you ever do uh, any hypnotic regressions to go more deeper into your own past? I did a lot in many ways. I actually teach and coach hypnotic regression to people who want to regress themselves or other people. Um, I talk about that in my seminars and my shows even sometimes in conferences. And um, yeah, we get a lot of work done through that, even for healing, for example. Many diseases can be healed through that. Um, I would like to say something else here as well, because people also get... Uh, wrong ideas about um, aliens and extraterrestrials because they have these images of Hollywood movies showing bad aliens, torturing, making people suffer, and etc. There, there are many, there have been and there still are new films coming out all the time showing how bad the aliens are, etc. This is just ma mental manipulation, manipulation, management by fear. You know, I mean, I've, I've been on, on board ships. I had children with my wife on board ships before we actually met on Earth. We had children on the ship. And um, we never suffered. You know, these guys, they have the technology. Uh, they're really, really advanced. We don't have to suffer. Well, I just wanted to say that in part. <laughs> you, you mentioned... Um at one point, when you, when you first contacted us, you're saying the nearing of the ascension process makes aliens come oh, closer yeah. to need. What do you mean by the ascension process? Okay, now this is really, really what I'm all about now. And I'm really, really moving uh, in that direction as far as my communication can go. Uh, the ascension process is the moving up of those who are ready on planet Earth to go up to the fifth dimension. We're currently in the third dimension and in the fourth. But the fourth dimension is like um, an in-between kind of dimension. So most of Earth and a lot of people now on this planet Earth uh, are actually uh, mostly in the fourth dimension, in fact. Uh, the fifth dimension is going to be completely different. We won't need physical bodies, for example. We will be uh, telepathic. We will be able to travel through other dimensions and do the other things. Now, the planet 
is changing at the moment. It's been changed, it's been maintained, it's been helped, assisted all along by aliens. It's been changing because uh, there are aliens and alien ships everywhere. I have a lot where I live here, for example, and the time and space portal here as well. And um, we are communicating, they are helping us. I am helping as much as I can through um, waking and awaking, in fact, as I like to say, um, people to understand what is going to them and to happen to them, what is going through them. And I will explain that in a minute. Um, the aliens who are helping Earth are actually, they're not necessarily from other planets. They can be aliens who actually have been on Earth longer than man has been even. Uh, in any case, all those are helping, are working to help raise the vibrations of the planet. This is why a lot of us feel, for example, very stressed, very tired all the time, with no apparent reasons because all those vibrations are affecting us. Plus, there is the precession of the equinox, which changes the axis of the Earth and the balance of everything. That is really, really a lot going through. Now, uh, aliens, uh, another important thing uh, I should say here is about communication. Aliens communicate in many, many different ways. I did a program here recently on that. They communicate, as I said, like the, the humans, they communicate through paper a lot. Uh, they have a Twitter account with a limited number of contacts on it through which they also communicate. I'm not one of the happy ones to have one, unfortunately, but they communicate to me through other means. Um, they can, um, many, many things can be a sign of communication. A chronic pain can be a sign that somebody somewhere wants to communicate with us. Um, um, an impairment, for example, somebody who, who suffers is usually somebody who in fact can actually heal himself or herself and other people. They are healers, in fact, those people. Uh, and here I'm one of them because I've had a lot of uh, physical trouble in the past. And um, yeah, that's all I mean. Unless you have more questions on this um, point. Well, uh, that you... What you've said just has me, brings up several different questions, so I'll try to address a couple here at a time. Just to clarify, okay, <laughs> the, okay. the ascension process, if I heard you correctly, you said that it's not everyone who's going to be ascending, it's only a few? It's only a certain chosen ones? Let, let me go deeper into this, as, as you are uh, suggesting. Um, in fact, everybody will ascend. There is no question about that. But it doesn't mean that the coming ascension process is going to be for everyone. Now, some people like to make other people believe that, you know, it's a free ride and everybody's going to get a joy ride on the ascension process and it's a free for all and etc. No, it's not actually going to happen like this. Some people, and more and more, I mean, we're talking about hundreds of millions of people on the planet today, yeah, are actually um, awake or ready or some people are also uh, what are called alien incarnates. So they are actually aliens, but they are um, they have been um, they were born as humans in fact, without being hybrids. By the way, uh, they may be or may not be. There are star seeds. There are lots of people here on the planet now. And let me say that again: before man dawned on this planet Earth, they were here before a long time before that. Uh, in any case, uh, people who are ready, people who work, we need to work. We uh, humans are on Earth to experience life through matter. It is a material experience. Uh, we have, that's why we suffer, for example, pain. Some people are born with a severe handicap or something. That is part of our experience. We choose that before we are born. This is a choice, a contract. The mission we have, um, and then um, let me see where I where was I? Um, so those people. Um, can you repeat your question, Mark? Sorry, I, um, I got waylaid here for a moment. <laughs> that, well, that's <laughs> that's okay. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, the uh, we were talking about the ascension yeah, process and who's now. Now you're you're bringing up another point here about which. Uh, people choosing different lives and different experiences, which is part of the reincarnation process. Um, people living lives supposedly uh, 
you, you, we choose the experiences that we're going to have in this lifetime in order to experience the most amount of growth, spiritual growth. Um, <clears throat> but my, my, I don't know. My, my other question regarding this ascension is if we are moving up into the, what you call the fifth dimension or plane, would mm-hmm. you know what is that plane going to be like compared to what we're experiencing now? Oh, paradise! <laughs> just before, if you'll allow me, Mark and Irene, for a minute, just before I answer that uh, and finish answering, because it's all coming back to me now. Um, your previous question: uh, People have to work, as I said. Uh, we have to work. We have to go through, for example, meditation. We have to heal our bodies, help our soul progress, learn new things all the time. We have to do something creative and positive to be of service to others, not to ourselves, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is a lot of work. I can develop that later on if you like. Now, about the ascension process, yes, the fifth dimension, oh, we can see I mean, you, all those people uh, who can already see into other dimensions like me, uh, it, it's magic out there for humans because we have cities of light. We can hear music uh, with so many different dimensions and instruments like you've never seen before. A lot of it is in light. It's really wonderful. Treatment and communication, everything is done through light. It's a light process. It's all waves, really, originally. Yeah. Have I answered your question, Mark? Yes. Um, the Do you have but, any but, more? But, well, I got a lot more, and we, we, we <laughs> okay, were just scratching like the the tip of the iceberg here. Um, the with this ascension and these changes that are happening, could that be an explanation for what I can only describe as the absolute insanity that seems to be gripping our current society these days? Um, You you know, uh, as a child of growing up in the 60s and 70s, sure, we've we've seen a humanity go through its share of turmoil but these last several years it, it, things are getting it's so crazy and so out of control and people are just flipping out over everything uh would you say that that is a possibly a reaction to these changes that are in process and directly, yes, but this is actually what we call an inverse or reverse light. This is, a, if you remember your Star Wars, this is the dark side of the Force. You know, all those people, that's what is also called New World Order, and where people want to manage uh, some people on this planet, and some of them are reptilians, but not only, uh, really want to, to use and abuse them. This is service to self, as opposed to service to others, which I was talking about a moment ago. Uh, those people, they are like the first um, Anunnaki who created men. They just wanted slaves. That's all they want. So it is part of the ascension process, but in the negative way. So those people who follow that path will not ascend. So, well, if they don't ascend, then those people who don't ascend, then what happens? Are they going to suddenly find themselves, you know, in a very depopulated? Well, is is, (laughs) is everyone else going to seem to have disappeared to them? Uh, oh, yes, we're, we're definitely going to be in other dimensions. Uh, yeah, 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 of course. Uh, it doesn't mean we will not be in contact because some of them uh, who will not ascend will progress in some way or should anyway. And they, and they have all the, all the opportunities to it for them to make. You know, aliens never interfere. We, have, we always have freedom of choice, even against the bad ones. Uh, if we do something, it's because we accept. Uh, if we don't do something, it also means we accept. If we don't do anything about a situation we don't like, it means we accept the situation as it is, and therefore we should not complain. We may be part of that for those people who are on the dark side of the force, but um, they will just have to wait for that turn. They will have to go back to, to square one and start again. I mean, when I say square one, 
it's going to be something like square three or four or five, but they're going to have to, to go back a long way and uh, revisit their choices, uh, their choice of evolution and of action uh, until they reach that awareness that they have to be of service to others. They have to live in a constructive, loving um, sort of environment and world. Then they will raise all the people who are doing this now they will raise their vibrations, and by, by raising their vibrations, their faculties and skills will de- will develop, and they will also rise, rise. And well, uh, and by rising, they will go up, and might ascend one day. Well, if you're saying we have free will in this in this um, matter, then how do you explain the the hundreds uh, or thousands of people who? claim to have had abduction experiences against their will uh, with genetic material taken, hybrid babies being shown to them. And a lot of these people are traumatized, suffering from post-traumatic stress and, you know, definitely feel like they're being violated. So where does the free will come in for those people? Well, as I said before, um, um, in fact, when I see that in American films, um, I'm not surprised. Don't get me wrong here, but American culture is that uh, people don't like to be touched when they don't want to be touched, etc. Other cultures don't mind so much. Uh, whatever we make of it, it's our choice. But whatever happened to us is something we chose before we incarnated, we came into this world. We knew this was going to have to happen, and we signed on the dotted line. So you're saying that those people who, in this life, feel like they're victims, feel like that they're they they don't know why this is happening to them, why this is you know they're having what they consider to be negative experiences. They actually chose to have these experiences with these alien and extraterrestrial races before they were incarnated into this life. Oh, they certainly did. Only they don't remember that they did because when. Uh, when we are born on this earth, we forget our past. This is why we need karmic regression, for example, to to go back or uh, to read um, Akashic memories, if you've heard about them. And uh, that's the only way. Or sometimes we get people who come and talk to us like aliens, for example, uh, and tell us or show us other things. They took me aboard some of their ships. They, they showed me things. They taught me things. I mean, I had a, a life in back in Atlantis 14,600 years ago, and I'm still in contact with Atlanteans. They come visit me and show me and teach me things. They continue. It's a great life. It's a very hard life I'm living, but it's a great life because I've always le- loved learning, and I'm learning all the time. I'm improving all the time. It's, it's really great. But yes, we all said yes. We all did. And of course, sometimes it may be painful for those people, uh, as I said, who don't remember, but because it is actually physically painful. But I'm not sure it's that that physically painful. Then again, all aliens are not that as advanced as one as another, but are certainly way more advanced than uh, humans. Uh, If they can come and reach people on Earth, they have to be. Uh, Then again, it's a question of um, perception. You know, like I said a moment ago, in some cultures, People don't like to be touched by strangers. They don't like to be forced. Uh, at the beginning, when I was a kid, I was afraid. It's not that I didn't like it. I was really afraid. I was really scared. And I didn't know what was happening to me. I refused to go to sleep. I refused to go to bed first, and then I refused to go to sleep. I made myself stay away and, uh, for years and years and years. And then in the end, I surrendered because I thought they always win. But then in the end, it wasn't bad. I cannot say that I really suffered, even from the people who were bad, from those aliens who were uh, negative with me and doing wrong things with me. I can't say that I even suffered. So they certainly have, have the touch there to to make you uh, either forget the pain or not feel the pain or do things without pain. Well, they're all different. They're like us. They're all different. Well, well you mentioned American films and culture, and I know that, you know, what 
basically for American media, fear is what sells. You know, they Hollywood has always done a great job of trying to scare the living shit out of people by, you know, alien invasion movies and like Independence Day. But in the end, the humans win. You know, it's all this uh, crazy no, kind of... Not the humans, Mark, the Americans. Oh, yes. The, well, no, no, no. They did have everybody around the world, but... I like that one. I yeah. Like that. Yeah, uh, yeah no, that's I true. Mean. It's it's yeah. it's the Americans. That's the, that's the culture we deal with over over here but you know what it, it's you know if, if i looked at any of the american films you know forgetting all mm-hmm. of that those crappy invasion movies i always still go back to steven spielberg's close encounters of the third kind as probably one of the most accurate uh portrayals of the alien and ET phenomenon and contact uh, because it was more of a positive experience. And the thing with Spielberg in that movie, I don't know because he wrote the script for it. And I'm really interested to know where he got a lot of his information at that time, because in 1978, not a lot was known about the alien abduction phenomenon. The Betty and Barney Hill case here in the United States was probably one of the more well-known cases at that time, but everything dealing with contactees, the psychic development of knowing things and and being drawn to that area and uh, all these different things. He just seemed to hit the nail on the head in so many different ways of the positive and more realistic aspects of the phenomenon while still keeping it mysterious to, all the way to the very end. It was still very mysterious and vague and not answering too many questions. Um, it's one of my favorite films, to be honest. But Mark, Mark, wasn't that based on a true event? Close Encounters? No. Yeah. No. I think it, uh, I'm sure it there, was. There are Someone elements. experience. No, no. There were elements of it that were based uh-huh. off of stories. But, you know, it was the first movie that did the that really focused on the government cover up doing everything mm. the government can to cover it up and make the public think there's nothing to see here and move on. Um, that was that was really big. The different types of uh, sightings that people have, abductions, like when the little boy yeah. was taken and abducted, came back at but, the uh, end. At the, at the end of the day, it was contact through the mind, wasn't it? It was contact like people were chosen certain people were chosen mm. and and those people felt that incredible draw of course it, it d- destroyed their personal lives but in the process normal life ceased to exist <laughs> for them um like in and um uh, and um uh, richard dreyfus's case but uh yeah, I'm not going to go on too long about it. We want to hear Jesse's story, but uh, yeah, again, yeah. for 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 th- a film that really mostly accurately portrays what's really you know going on, or at least is true to the spirit, it's that movie. Now, I will say, what's funny is um, when when they were filming Jaws, his first movie, he actually in two shots captured a UFO, and then it and it made it in the movie. There's two yeah. shots where you could see oh, a yeah, UFO. I like that. Yeah, wow. Yeah, in the scene where the shark attacks their boat at night and they run up on deck and Roy Scheider's looking and all of a sudden you see this UFO go streaking right past his head, leaving leaving like a, a, a fiery trail going right behind him. Um, very, wow. very, very cool. <clears throat> so, but... So, yeah, uh, American movies and media, you know, and even television shows, it's all about fighting the aliens. It's, it's nothing ever really positive that's mentioned anymore because in our society, it's whatever makes you afraid or scares you, that's what sells. That's why horror movies over here are all the rage right now. Yeah, well, that's what gets bums on seats, isn't it? Yep. Yep. Yeah, that, or su- that or superheroes. I- yeah, I would say you need to take another look at religion, too, on that matter. It's management by fear in a lot of cases. I don't mm. mean spirituality. I mean religion. But, yeah, it sells everywhere. And, 
we we are being manipulated all the time. It's for us to to take or leave in actual fact, and that's how it works. I wanted to say, um, if I'm not interrupting you, Mark or Eileen, there, I wanted to say a few things. I mean, for me, normal has never been my life. I was, uh, you know, somebody one day told me, oh, people should come out of their comfort zone, and I said, what is a comfort zone? <laughs> I've never known one. <laughs> And I was always, uh, paranormal is normal to me. That's my life all over. Um, you said about, um, what is the name of that uh, film again? Yes, Close Encounters of the Third Time. There are many, many, many films, many series, in fact, which were either inspired, either co-designed and co-produced, by aliens because there is really a message there that needs to be carried over and i've actually got a show again i need to do that in english now but uh, i've actually got a full show on that and uh, yes because there is a selection of actual good space uh, space operas and things where there are really really messages for humans um you said about uh, we talked about star wars a moment ago avatar is one of them as well for the biggest one and certainly one of my favorite films too um there are many 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 things i mean we we um, i don't think we're going to have time on this show to talk about them because it's really a long list you really have to pick and choose which ones are which but yes there is a message there for humans it's completely intentional now this ascension that's happening and it's ongoing you know uh, i i i i have to ask because people are, people are going to ask me i know uh, is when is it supposed to to complete how long how long is this transition process supposed to last so when could we look forward to at least hope those of us i hope that make it um look forward to um transitioning over into this fifth dimension now, people will ask you, and I would add people should ask, <laughs> because it's uh, everybody's concern. When is it going to happen? There are many, many, many different options. I'm not sure it's all going to happen all at once, to be honest. This is not what I feel and or the message I get. Some people say it's going to happen in about 10 to 15 years. Other people say uh, it's happened already for some of them, and it probably has too. Um, I think I, I I would be inclined to say it's like drafts, really. You know, sometimes some people move up while other people stay here. Then other people will get ready, let's say, 82 years later or whatever time later. And then they will go up. And then a little later, more people are ready. So they go up. I think it's a recent process, but that, that is ongoing if you ask me that's the way i see it anyway see and the reason i want to know because i'm ready i i'm ready to move on and get out of this <laughs> i'm tired of where 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 we're, i'm living in this society and uh, where we are as a as a human race right now is uh pretty depressing for me so you know hey if there if there's a way that we can advance on up i'm ready take me <laughs> one of the ways <laughs> one of the ways, Mark, is by um, getting involved, taking part, partnering with those people who are helping through the ascension process for people to go up, to attend. Um, I do that all the time. Um, I don't know what you do, but uh, a lot of people are doing a lot of things already. Like I said, service to others is one of them. Love, peace refusing to do things, refusing to buy things. Because, for example, we know that if we buy products with palm oil, we're killing forests and animals. Uh, some children are still working in parts of the world to make our clothes, to make our this, our that. This is also a choice. It is part of this. Helping them as much as we can, educating. All this is very, very important. Decreasing. I don't know whether you've heard of decreasing in America. Stop buying and spending all the time, living and being happy with what we've got. Do we need the latest smartphone? Do we need the latest car? Do we need two cars in one family, etc.? All oh, this is part of it. Well, we'll so see. That's, that's in the shop. Sorry, <clears throat> I mean, yeah. 
<laughs> That's the right. end of shopping for me then. <laughs> I love my shopping. Well, you know you know what they say, Irene, girls will be girls. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I am vegetarian, so I don't touch leather and things like that. Oh uh, you know? well that's one good point and, for you. I'll put in a good word for you then. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, many, many, many things. Sorry, Mark, yeah, go on. that's okay. I, I, unfortunately, I'm not quite there on the vegetarian thing yet. I still like no, like no, some things, not, but you? you know, that's that's uh, maybe maybe one day we'll see. But uh, as far Mark, as Mark, I'm not, I'm not t- pushing. I'm not imposing. I'm just proposing, offering. I tell I tell you something, Mark. Right when I was in Italy, a friend of mine, Lucia, she was telling me about how so many people, especially young men, are becoming uh, are going um, vegan, and in this country too, there is such a big turnover to veganism. Oh, it's, ha- it's it's happening like here in France, or whether it's you know, but oh no no no, French people everywhere. French. No, French people love their meat. Yeah. <laughs> there are some, of course, there are. Oh, you think, it, you think uh, the Italians would as well, but she was telling me there are so many going vegan out there. It's unbelievable. Oh, you know, you, oh, you know I could tell you a couple of, uh, quickly, in Edgeway, uh, a couple of quick stories about French people and vegetarianism. One day, um, somebody uh, invited me to a restaurant, and it was a meat restaurant. And I said, oh, that's a nice idea, only... And, they didn't know that I was a vegetarian. And they say, oh, why don't you have fish? I said, but I'm a vegetarian. And they said, yes, yeah, so you can have fish. But French people, fish is not meat, somehow. <laughs> so it's really, really strange the vision they have. Were you, were you, talk, you were talking about that? When I was out there, she dished up some pasta. A friend of mine dished up some pasta. And there was ham in it. And I said, yeah, yeah, meat of course. It. I, I can't eat this. It's meat in it. Oh, ham's not meat. It's not meat. That's right. <laughs> oh, another night, and, and another quick one. Another night, I went out with a few friends of one of my friends, mm. and um, they, all, the boys, we were all men, and the boys decided to go to a steakhouse. And I said, "Well, that's fine. Only I'm a vegetarian." And they said, "Oh, you can have a salad." I said, "I didn't say I was a cow. I said I'm a vegetarian." <laughs> <laughs> it's all those ideas, you know, people have about vegetarians and vegans, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. One thing I wanted to ask you: uh, you yes, talked Irene. about the uh, alien race that are octopuses, oct- octopi. A friend of mine, many, many years ago, was uh, troubled because she was telling me that she was attacked by something which was alien that was in the shape of an octopus. Uh huh. Okay. And she was um, continuously, night after night, being attacked by this thing. Right. I have actually met three types of octopi. Well, this this okay. one had a big hook that it put into the top of her head, like a big talon type thing uh-huh uh, uh, no it doesn't look like the one i met but uh, you know there are again i could say many things about instances like this because um some people are just afraid because they see this strange creature or animal following them and in fact it doesn't mean that the creature actually means them harm but they may be um uh, acting in a way that seems aggressive to humans but is not to them so it could be a, a, a case of interpretation we're looking at here uh, or something else. Maybe it was genuine attack. I don't know. I wasn't there. Uh, the other thing is whenever people are um, facing a situation like that, they can always just say no. They can say it. They can think it because um, telepathy is very, very active yeah. in, uh, in many, many systems and many kinds of racism, et cetera. This is how prayer works, for example, in telepathy uh, and things like that. But um, yes, but like I said before, not all aliens may be friendly. But mm. it could just be, you know, what, one night I was a student and I was coming back home and suddenly I felt this being, this, you know, it was the size of a basketball and it was all hairy. And it was really hairy and scary, and it was flying above my shoulder there, and it was following me everywhere, and I was really, really scared. 
I was uh, 22, I think, at the time. And it was really something out of this world. And at that time, it was dead of night. It was like two or three o'clock in the morning. And um, I was really, really afraid. Only I didn't know what it was and what, who, what was following me, nor why, nor how even, because it was like floating in the air. And then uh, looking back on the events now, I think, in fact, that thing never did anything bad to me. It was quite friendly in the end. Only I was afraid because I didn't know what it was and I didn't know what to do with it. Mm. And the bird people, what, the birds, the birds, the aliens. Are the, a- uh, the aliens, uh, yes. Yeah, they are called the aliens. Uh, yeah, are they? Uh, I know I have read stories and uh, been told by people that these are bird people they call them the bird people mm-hmm. and yeah. uh you can hear them like a whistling yeah, that's like their a whistle. Language. yeah yeah that's part of their language yeah and someone sent me a video i've lost it i don't know where it is now but it was a video of him in his house and all you could hear all all the time was all this whistling going on but there was no birds in that room or anything you know, and I I've, was, I've been on investigations when I've where I've actually heard these whistles. Uh-huh. So, you know, they, they could just be trying to contact her and to talk to her. It hmm. could just be that it happens to me. Things move around me. Things disappear and appear in this flat here. Uh-huh. You know, I've seen things move. My my mattress moves when I'm lying in bed. Hmm. Okay, and I'm not lying. I can tell you. And uh, my blankets move when I'm not moving at all. It's happened to me a few times. Yeah. Uh, so so there, is, and, there is definitely something called, a, the well, the bird people, as I call them, well, uh, avian. Yeah, well, let, let me ask you a question. I've heard of the blue avians that they're supposed to be blue colored. So a lot of them are, like yes, like the Egyptian god Toth. Yeah. He was one of them originally. Thoth, Thoth was a uh, an avian. He was, yeah. Oh, interesting. That's interesting. Oh. Yeah. Uh, there is a show again here, but it is in French. But um, there is somebody like me who's in contact with uh, all sorts of aliens. And he's done a show on aliens. It's really amazing. Yeah. They're quite friendly, in fact. Aliens are really, really friendly. I saw one recently from... Um, who was really new for me because I'd never met an avian myself uh, from another planet. And he was like um, like a hawk. In fact, his head was like a hawk. He mm. was really friendly. He was really friendly. So you, you met him in person? Yep. Uh, how, did, how did that happen? Oh, they just materialized here. Materialize here. You know, they walk through walls. They take me away. I could tell you a lot about all these uh, encounters I have. Some other times I just perceive them or see them into their dimensions. Sometimes they take me into their dimensions or on their planet. It's a lot of things. I have a lot of people at the moment from Antares, for example. Lots of Antarians are coming here and uh, making themselves um, seen by me. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're really good people. It's really, really interesting. A lot of them are also guardian angels. I'm beginning to see the guardian angels and the guides for people. I saw a fairy one day. I didn't think they existed, and I saw one about three months ago. I was really happy. And um, lots of them, um, all sorts of creatures um, from everywhere. Anyway, yeah. I, I'm, I'll let you go through the questions if you have any. Oh, well, I just wanted to say for anybody that heard a squawking in the background earlier on, it was not uh, a bird person, uh, an avian or whatever. It was Pickles Pee Wee the parrot. Um, too. <laughs> and, and, he was really, he was, and he's, he's your gre- he's your green avian. He's my green <laughs> avian, yeah. And, 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 he's, he's, and he's one of the evil ones. He definitely is one of the evil ones. And yeah, he... because they repeat everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he'll rip your face off, too, if you get close enough. Oh, yeah. gosh. <laughs> and he, he was ringing his bell. I do try to remove his cage out of the room when we're doing a show, but with my back being so bad at the moment, I couldn't move that, that cage. It's too big and too heavy. So I've had to leave him in here tonight. So I apologize to anybody that did hear 
my bird person <laughs> tonight. <laughs> During the show. Your personal avian. <laughs> and that's for you too, Jess, because when you listen back to this show, you'll hear a squawking and you would have thought to yourself, what the hell's that in the background? Oh, I haven't heard anything yet, but uh, I'll keep, uh, I keep an ear out for it. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it'll be on the... T- either him or the ringing of his bell will be on okay. the... Thing. Anyway, so getting back to that. Uh, you don't think maybe that half of these aliens we're talking when we think of aliens, we think of them from another planet, another dimension, or, or another planet, or anything. Do you think that they could be natural to this earth plane? Oh, yeah, like, like I said, a moment, like, like, like I said, like we say the fairies are the goblins and things like that. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Like I said a moment ago, aliens were here, reptilians, um, amongst others were here a long time before uh, humans were on the planet, yeah. yes, before man appeared. Some of them came from other planets and created man here. And mm-hmm. when they came, there were already aliens living here who actually live underground. There are also other races who live on the planet. Other, I mean, other um, humanoid races. They found one in Iran a few years ago, which was filmed. Uh, which is really different from uh, Homo sapiens sapiens like uh, most of us. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, there are lots of things. And, of course, some of them live in other dimensions. Some of them live inside the Earth. And uh, there's lots of them. Yeah, well, it's really I, busy out there. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stories of of aliens, even especially reptilians, living underground under the Earth. Uh, or there's also the hollow Earth theory that the earth itself is hollow and there's like a vast underground network of <clears throat> of an entire ecosystem underground where a lot of these different races it, live yeah there is a lot of talk and there are lots of stories about that and in fact there is a lot of confusion because yes the earth is hollow yes of course but it is in another dimension so I mean, if you were to go down, uh, yeah, I mean, if uh, a- any guy was just going to go down uh, under the earth one way or another, like in Jules Verne's story, Journey to the Center of the Earth, for example, and think they'd meet people, they wouldn't meet them even if they were among them. Now, th- this is actually the same thing. You're raising an interesting point there, Mark. This is actually the same thing for humans wanted. Uh, wanting to terraform and go and live on another planet. I hope you've seen the film The Titan because it is a great film. It's with um, oh, the guy who was the hero in Avatar. Sam yes, I, I, I saw I that movie actually. It was a. It's on Netflix it, over here. Probably, yeah. I saw it. I can't remember where I went, but I just loved it. In fact, I actually watched it twice. Uh, it's really great, and people, uh, a lot of humans are trying to go to other planet and thinking, oh, this, you know, this um, planet is you, is man-friendly or whatever, and we can go and live there. Well, th- a lot of this is pure conjecturing because, uh, yeah, the planet might be similar to Earth, but the density might be 10 times the density we have here, which means if any man wa- um, landed, ever landed there, they would be crushed on arrival on, on the, under their own weight. Uh, on some of them, it rains glass, not water. On some of them, the seas are methane. They're not water. So could, could people live on that? Some of them never see the, the, the light. Some of them are always in the light. Um, so it's going to be really difficult. And it doesn't mean that because humans who might go there one day don't see people there. It doesn't mean that that planet is not inhabited because they all are only they are in other dimensions. I have uh, one of my friends I mentioned earlier here. Uh, she is in contact with Venusians and Martians. Well, you know, and the uh, humans tend to think there's nobody there. They're just dead planets, but they're not. People live in in different ways and different systems, different types of life. Well, you know, there's always a, a lot of theories about life on Mars. You know, and I love for some reason I've always been very attracted to Mars. Mars really calls to me um and uh i i do believe that there was definitely a past civilization there whether anything is still alive there now i don't know but the venus on the other hand 
<clears throat> is interesting because they call Venus our twin, our sister planet. It's about the same size as Earth. It's in the habitable zone from the from the sun, and yet. Something went seriously wrong on Venus where the greenhouse gases went nuts and it's the temperatures on the planet are 900 degrees and, uh, no, you know, any any life form, uh, even the basic molecules of life would simply fall apart in in the intense heat uh, of Venus. Yet, from what you're saying is there's life there, but it's existing in another dimension. Yeah, there is. Let me give you another example to to approach the the idea from another angle, if I may. Uh, I'm one of those people. One of the reasons uh, I've always found life very, very difficult on Earth is I'm photophobic. The sunlight is way too strong for me. It's bad for my skin. It just doesn't agree with me at all. But I come from planets which are mostly dark. That's why when I'm on those planets, I'm fine. When uh, as soon as the temperature reaches 12 degrees centigrade here, I'm near nuclear fusion. My body is boiling and I'm sweating like mad. In fact, I never wear warm clothes, no matter what the weather is, uh, because I'm just like that. Because people on those planets, which are different, they may not, um, they, they, they actually, I mean, not they may not, they actually live in completely different conditions. They have evolved and adapted to the conditions of those planets. Now, we are what only a- like this here as humans because we answer the vibrations and whatever we need uh, on our planet. Let's take an example, for example, uh, between uh, Europeans and Africans. Now, Africans have a dark skin because the melatonin works that way in their skin. Back there originally, of course, not those who now live in Europe or in America, for example. And people who are originally European didn't need so much melatonin, uh, melanin, sorry, to, um, to, to protect their skin and et cetera. Now, of course, things are changing and the climate is also changing in most places on the planet. So. Well, does, does that help uh, understanding uh, why or how? A, a little bit, okay. yes. I mean, uh, what I was mm-hmm. mainly trying to get is that you know, if on some of these other planets they, where it doesn't seem like there should be life because the the environment is hostile to us, like Venus, uh, you were the way you were mentioning that there is life there from, but in other dimensions. Yep. Okay. You're going back to what I was saying there. <laughs> okay. Well, um, now you had mentioned earlier that you yourself have been to other planets. In, in this yeah, lifetime, many times. Ma- many times in this lifetime, can you describe what yeah. those planets are like? Ah, uh, it's very, very different. One of them is really cold. It's got very, very poor lighting compared to with Earth. Um, it's uh, cold. People there are um, blue. They have a blue skin. When I go there, my skin becomes blue because I change also physically when I get there. Um, it's like shape shifting in a way. Uh, the hair is white, completely white. And of course, people uh, don't eat on that planet because on many planets, people don't need to eat. They just need to breathe. And they breathe the energy through their skin and through their um, respiratory system. And they just feed like that. Uh, like a lot of pe- like a, a lot of people on many planets don't actually have children. They just clone. Um, they are completely, completely different, yes. One of them is very similar to Earth. The one I went with um, Anubis, do you know Anubis, the Greek, uh, the Egyptian god? You there, Mark? Yes, I'm here. Which yes. which Egyptian he, goddess? He came, he came to me a few times. He's actually from Atlantis originally, and Atlantis is, uh, Atlanteans come from the area of Sirius. And originally, and uh, he took me back there uh, on his planet, and it was a bit like Earth, actually. I was surprised. I didn't expect that. Uh, a good film to mention here is Contact with Jodie Foster, which, of course, was written by Carl Sagan, so that says a lot for itself. Well, um, the, I didn't catch which Egyptian god, suppose, uh, t- w- took you there? An- Anubis. 
Anubis. He's got okay. A, a dog head. Yes, the dog head he's Anubis. The, the one. Yeah, he's the one who took people into the realm of the dead. Well, yeah, Edgar Casey, who was the they called the sleeping prophet from uh, mm-hmm. America. You know, he in his readings, he he was one of the ones who really put the idea of Atlantis, Atlanteans uh, migrating into the e- Egypt um, in his readings. And so now we've always thought that e- um, the Atlanteans were a human civilization, that for whatever reason there was a catastrophe, the island sank pretty much, and so some survivors scattered across the globe. But you're saying the Atlanteans themselves weren't really from Earth. They came from somewhere else. Um, yes. In fact, I, I, I'm quite aware of most of, not all, but most of the work of Edgar Casey. He was uh, really very, very um, informative in many, many ways. Um, when I was a student, I was really young at the time. Uh, now, uh, in fact, um, I, I did a whole program on Atlantis, but just to put it, uh, to cut a long story short, Atlanteans were actually aliens from the eighth uh, density or dimension, if you like, who came to Earth to live like humans, uh, to experience a material life. They came down, and the longer they stayed on Earth, there were different. There were seven races. Every time they came down in vibration, and they came down from spiritual. Um, immaterial beings, if you like, uh, and materializing more every time with every new race, down the seven races, uh, until uh, Atlantis collapsed. But in fact, it's, the reason Atlantis has not been found on Earth is because Atlantis, at the time the Atlanteans were here, was on Earth, but in another dimension. And the Atlanteans came down in vibration. And when aliens come down in vibration for too long and too often, they cannot go back up uh, or raise their vibrations again. So they have to stay down. And what they did is, in fact, they stayed here for a long time. They, they were on New, they were on Atlantis, they were on Lemuria at the time, and they helped because they were also uh, people who worked a lot with technology. They were very good with armaments, for example, designing tanks and things like that, and war planes and war machines. And they stayed on, and as they stayed on and lowered their vibration, every new race of Atlanteans came down in vibration. They became uh, human in the end. They became the Toltecs, for example. And uh, they came down and stayed and spread all over the planet. And those who stayed started teaching the ancient Egyptians. When I mean the ancient Egyptians, they are not the ancient Egyptians we, we hear about and are taught in schools. They are the Egyptians before those Egyptians, which in Egyptian history, by the Egyptians, were called the, the god kings at the time. Because in fact, to them, they were like gods. They started, and that's one of the shows I did, uh, they started Egyptian religion and civilization, which is why we don't understand now how people could do these buildings, could do this, could do that, without any equipment of any sort. It's because in those days, there were people here on Earth, the Atlanteans were some of them, who actually um, had very, 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 very advanced technology. Have to date, in fact, yet. And um, so they could teach the early, very, very early Egyptians, and they taught them. They taught them to speak, they gave them their language. In fact, the idea that started with the Toltecs, too. The idea was to give uh, man a sense of civilization, of state, of nation, of ethics, of science. They taught them uh, archery, pot pottery, uh, making fire, architecture, mathematics, etc., etc., etc. That's how it started. And in the end, the, the, the later, if you like, Atlanteans, they were actually humans. They were just like us. 
But those I'm talking about going back uh, 16,000 years ago and before, they were humanoids. They, they, they still had retained some of their hybrid forms from hence where they came. And uh, they, um, but they were really tall. That's why the buildings are really, and the buildings and the monuments we see everywhere in Egypt, in Turkey, and uh, Machu Picchu, etc., in uh, Central and South America. If you go to uh, Puma Punku, uh, Oyantai Tambo, etc., they were really, really tall. So they needed tall things. And today we find giants. That's another program I did on giants. Uh, we find giant rem- remnants everywhere. There are really, really big bones of people who were like 10 meters tall, 10 meters at uh, 30 feet. Yeah, we, and I, the Atlanteans and those I met were 350. Three the, meters 50. They were what? They were three meters 50 tall, three and a half meters tall. Oh, wow. Those are... That is um, that's about 12 feet, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's around about that. Yeah, giant, giant cool. snark. And how, how, yeah, many, were, how much of that has been said about giants? Well, there are, are a lot of stories you, of giants uh, not going all the way back into biblical times and mythology, yeah. but even, you know, we've talked with um, uh, researchers nowadays it, who... What, Irene? Wasn't it Jason we we uh, helped or you you edited his book? <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Jason Gerald, giants, who wrote his he? book Ages of the Giants, which is looking yeah. at the Adena Mound culture here in the US and Ooh. the giant skeletons that were reportedly found and of course whisked away by the Smithsonian, never to be seen again. So but um you know can I just Mark, excuse me, can I just say something about the Smithsonian, because apparently the American High Court of Justice, or some American High Court of Justice, has actually asked uh, the Smithsonian um, Institute to justify the fact that they actually literally crashed down to powder um, uh, thousands of giant skeletons they were keeping in their vaults. And they actually were summoned to um, talk about their works. Nothing has materialized yet, I'm sorry to say, but uh, there was some reaction, I'm happy to say, because uh, what's been lost has been lost anyway. We'll never see those skeletons again now, but at least we had some uh, information about them. But more and more, found all the time everywhere, actually. Well, yeah, they, they, a lot of that happened because they it was decided very early on, we can't upset the apple cart. We need everybody to... You know, if 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 giants or or different races of humanity were proven to coexist, that that really throws a big monkey wrench into organized religion, and uh, and changes our whole view of our history. And they can't have that happening. They need people to be good little sheep, go out and consume, like you said, buy, 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 and uh, and uh, don't ask too many questions. Uh, you know, that's why spend, I... Spend, 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 yeah. Yep. <clears throat> why I feel a and lot of our reality and the truth of our reality is hidden from us. It's kind of like living mm-hmm. in the Matrix. You know, the it's all an illusion. Our, our society is an illusion. And definitely don't look behind the curtain because uh, what you see may, may disturb you. Exactly. Yeah. Well, then again, we can go back to those films. Or uh, another good example here is the Truman Show. Maybe you've seen that with Jim Carrey. And uh, he lives in a kind of Matrix, too. Say that again. I didn't catch that part. Uh, sorry, Mark. I was talking about the film, the Jim Carrey film with um, oh, uh, the called tr- um, the Truman the Show. Truman yeah, Show. yeah. This is another kind of Matrix too. You know, it is. It's 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 a sanitized reality um, that they don't want us to know about. And you know, people like yourself uh, who have come forward with their experiences. There have been so many books written about it by very credible authors and researchers, and yet the mainstream society still treats it as you know uh, a novelty. 
but nothing to be taken seriously. Certainly mainstream science ignores most of what's happening. But, you know, little by little, things are coming out. Like here here in the U.S., there are a couple of pieces of camera footage from U.S. fighter jets chasing down um, these uh, UFOs uh, that outmaneuvered the jets and whatnot. These things were released and... And it's been made public, and even the Navy called them UFOs because they don't know what they are, and they admitted that they that they filmed them. Now, in the past, those that kind of information would have been shuffled off, buried, and uh, never see the light of day. But you know, a little by little, some of this information is coming out to the public. But even then, the public is is so distracted by their iPhones, by their by their social media accounts, by taking selfies, by you know doing whatever the television tells them to do. You know what to buy, what to watch, what you know. Entertainment is the name of the game, and so nobody cares. You know, nobody. Yeah, that's what. The Romans started that, you know. They said, "Give the people fun and bread, and uh, you will be uh, you won't have to rule because they will just rule themselves." <laughs> so, you know, this is why I I personally w- wish I could get past all this because I get tired of it. There's this great movie, uh, B movie. I've mentioned this movie several times. Uh, John Carpenter made it back in the late '80s called They Live. Um, started the uh, American wrestler Rowdy Roddy Piper but w- the the movie was uh, a satire on the day about capitalism and greed but it it unknowingly or maybe he did know it and he slipped it in there showed us like the movie The Matrix did what's really going on behind society and how people are brainwashed. It turns out that all the rich and powerful uh, and and our world leaders were actually aliens, you know, using us for our resources mm-hmm. and then buying off certain humans, paying them off to keep them in line while the rest of us are just slaves to society. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. And... um you know they 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 make these special sunglasses. You put them on, you can see them for who they really are. You see behind beyond the illusion and all the subliminal messages that are on out there telling people to consume and obey and procreate and worship money and and uh, it was a it was a again a little B action movie that is so relevant to what I feel is going on today. Uh, this is what is happening today with the new world order, with the um, with the happening with the, of of the new world order. This is exactly that too. Yeah. Yes. And now, is there really a new world order? Oh, there is. Oh, there is, Mark. I would say there is. You know, I I came. Um, I lived abroad and I lived in many countries for many many years, and I came back to Paris. In nine, early 1986, it's been quite a while now, but when I came back here, I thought, my God, the world has really changed. I, I thought I was on another planet. And then I went to live in Switzerland, and I found the same changed world. Then I went back to England, and I found the same changed world. I thought, oh, my God, what is happening to this world? And when I told my friends, they said, what are you talking about? Nothing has changed. They didn't realize, you know? And I thought, oh, no, 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 people are really changing, there's no friendship anymore, no mutual assistance, everything has disappeared, you know? People were afraid, they were living in a world of um, refuging into consumption rather than into action. We were just after the new age area, which was really full of promises. Um, that was That had all died. Uh, I didn't grow up as a child, I mean, I was born in 1960, right? And you said about the 1960s and the 70s earlier on yourself, Mark. We didn't live in this world. I mean, I don't know in America, I'm talking about Europe here, huh? but we certainly didn't live like this. People, people suddenly became distant, unfriendly, selfish, arrogant. I mean, social networks haven't helped either because now everybody's got their faces glued to their smartphone. And it, it's really, really sad, you know? You go to a restaurant, you see this family, uh, they're, they're having dinner together, and nobody's talking, they're all each on their own smartphone. Yeah, it's and that's something <laughs> the futurists and all the sci-fi movies when they came up with all this great technology 
they never realize the negative as- aspect of it, which is people become so self-absorbed by flipping through their phones, looking to see what's happening on social media, or taking selfies of themselves with Snapchat and all these different apps, and and they're so involved, they're not communicating face to face anymore. They're not interacting with each other. You know, it's it's be- the same with holidays. People go somewhere. They actually, I mean, Irene was talking about her holidays a moment ago. You know, people will go to Venice. They will not see Venice. They will film Venice. And they go back home and they say, oh, look at this. I didn't see this. I didn't see that. So, in fact, they saw nothing of Venice. Of Venice because no, that's they, true. Were, they were just there filming. That's true. Everywhere, there was hundreds and thousands of people in the square, and they were all taking selfies, Mark. Yeah. You know, or there'll be a girl standing there posing with the leg out and one thing or another to make herself look slim while the fella was taking a photograph of her. Everywhere, my husband and I, we were just photobombing, just going around behind them, grinning, you know. In the I, I love doing that. <laughs> I love photobombing I, I've people. Had, I've actually I think, gone to I think, the... <laughs> I think we were the only two in the square that was not taking photographs of ourselves all the time. We were taking photographs uh, of the buildings. I've yeah. gone that way too when I go anywhere. Now, I hardly ever take pictures anymore. No. I've done it. I've, I've gone the other way, completely the other way. I just, I prefer to just be there in the it's, street, it's like, talk to people, yeah. you know. All oh, this is so important for me. It's, and this like, is it's like you said, though. It's like you said, Jesse. You cannot <laughs> go into a restaurant, sit down and just sit there and talk. Uh, everybody has their phones out. They have their phones out. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And, and then if there's somebody in trouble out on the street, instead of jumping in and helping, oh, people are whipping out it. their phones to film it and post it on social yeah, media. That's right. That's somebody's right. somebody's we're, getting we're beat long, up. We're a long way from space and the ascension here. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it feels... People move, uh, behaving like this, you know, the... It, feel, it yeah, feels well, like we've de-evolved, to be honest, as a society, um, instead of evolved. Because the more te- technology we get, uh, you know, the, and the greater technology and all the new toys that come out, I, I think it makes us dumber. It, we're, it's a great it dumbing down of society. It does. You were talking about books a moment ago, um, Mark. I, I've written a few books about some of my experiences with aliens, and I've got another one uh, which should be coming out soon. The trouble with the latest one is I've got new things coming out all the time and new events happening to me all the time, and I'm learning new things. The other night they were there. They woke me up in the middle of the night and they were feeding me information and implanting me with something to enhance my skills. It was really, really enthralling. And, but I couldn't go back to sleep with that, so I was up all night after this. And all things were coming down, coming down to me, all the new codes, communication, etc. Language, my alien languages are developing. I'm learning new words and new things all the time. So that I'm I'm supposed to be putting this in my book, but I, so I cannot I cannot actually publishing publish it because there are just so many new things happening and all the time. And the more I experience this, you know, the less uh, I can live on this planet. The harder it is for me to live on Earth. You know, I feel like shouting, "I'm an alien! Get me out of here! <laughs> I don't want to stay." <laughs> oh God, yeah, that's like uh, I want to put out my. Um my electric thumb, you know, and he, like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and hitch a ride out of here. Um, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, you mentioned that you get the downloads. I mean, do you, does that happen regularly where you feel like you're getting information downloaded into you? Oh, boy, when doesn't it happen? It's all the time. I've got, I, I'm actually talking to you. I'm in my lounge here in uh, just outside Paris, and I've got aliens in the lounge. There are three light beings here with me. Whoa, 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 wait, wait. Okay, wait. Hold on. <clears throat> Let me clarify. Are they there physically or are they or you just sense their presence? I can see them. No, you would you probably wouldn't see them, but I can see them and they're here with me and I can feel and communicate with them. Do so what do they think about us and what we're talking about here today? 
who they always think the same thing. They just come here to help us. And all they say is uh, they, 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 they train us, they inform us. They assist us. They assist me a lot when I do healings. For example, they come. Oh, I've got something else. Somebody else who regularly comes. It's Mother Mary. She comes regularly and helps me all the time. Ma- no, no, you're talking about Mar- uh, like Virgin, in Catholic Virgin Mary, Virgin yeah. Virgin Mary, Mother Mary. Yes. She, she, okay. Yeah. See, I've always had an issue with that, <laughs> only because. <laughs> Uh, the Virgin, you know, the in Catholicism, and I'm not a Catholic. Uh, Catholicism, they always ref- they they deify her, they pray to her, they she they always call her the Virgin Mary, which she really wasn't a virgin because she had other kids besides Jesus, the normal way. So, uh, and even Jesus, if if the stories are true, sounds to me more like um, in vitro fertilization than. Um, than a miracle, but you know, more science than than anything. But why would Mary coming through? Why would you think she comes through? And what makes her so important? Because other than from a Catholic standpoint, she I don't understand why she has become such an important figure. Now. Uh, at the risk of upsetting a few of our listeners here, I would like to say that uh, this a lot of religions are what people made of religion. This is not what they were designed to be at the beginning, and they are not spirituality. I was never a religious person. In my family, there are Catholics but who don't go to church, who don't follow anything religious. There are Protestants. There are, I'm a Jew. My mother's family is Jewish. Um, I married an Iranian, so when we got married in Iran, I had to convert to Islam. But that doesn't make me a religious person at all. It is fascinating and very interesting because I've learned a lot about religions in general, and I'm still studying a lot um, about religion. But uh, I'm also learning about the true message of religion. Now, just to talk about Mother Mary, um, there are um, what are called um, ascended masters. Jesus Christ was one of them. He had a a body to come and incarnate onto earth, but he's actually uh, a master. He's a creature of a creature, sorry, of um, of light. uh, Who is very, very high? Who has who has very high powers? who communicates with some of um, with a lot of people, I say some, no, a lot of people on this planet. Um, I have no interaction with him, but uh, Mother Mary is one of them. She had her earthly plane body, uh, which was not necessarily the one uh, we are taught about, uh, but she's still, um, she's one of those people who, who will be here forever to help mankind. And when I was, um, I just got into Paris. I was 20 or so 27. One evening, I got back home. I had really long and hard work, working days, and um, I always worked a lot because I love my work and I love working. And so I came back really late, and I was really, really tired. And uh, all I wanted to do was to lie down and sleep. And it was late. I hadn't had dinner, but I just wanted to lie down and sleep. So then I got home. Didn't even take my clothes off. I, I took my coat off, but not my clothes. I just lay there on the bed, and, and like something was pushing me to do that, driving me to do that. It was something beyond my control. Then I was there, I lay on the bed, and suddenly I saw this white light rising from the ground um, next to the bed. And this white light rose to about 160 high, one meter 60 high. And suddenly it turned into the shape of Mother Mary. Now, I'm not a Christian. Mother Mary was nothing to me. And I thought, on, on the spur of the moment, I thought, no, come on, Jesse, you're just being delusional. You're just being pink. <laughs> and Mother Mary, what is she doing here? But she was actually there. She materialized. She just stretched her arm joint above my uh, stomach. So our hands were like about, I don't know, about about a yard above my stomach as I was lying in bed. 
And um, she started moving her hands in a circular motion, crossing the hands in the opposite circular motions. And suddenly I felt in my stomach and my belly being really warm and feeling really, really good. And uh, that went on for a few minutes, I don't know, maybe for five minutes. And then she withdrew her hand. Um, her, her arms fell akimbo again. Then the light disappeared. She disappeared. And I felt full of energy. I felt really, really good. And I was back in the dark again. And I thought, oh, my God, now I need to eat. I was ready for another day's work, actually. I was so full of energy. And the funny thing about it is I had always had, ever since I was born, problems with my stomach. I even had, when I was 21, I had a stomach ulcer, which was really painful. And in those days, they didn't cure them as fast or as easily as they do now. It was really, really hard. Ever since that day, now we're going back 33 years ago, I've never had stomach problems again. And she appeared to me on other occasions, helping me with other things. Very interesting. The um, yeah. <clears throat> with with the different um, all the different uh, entities that you've been in contact with. There's one name that that came to my attention uh, several years ago, and I'm just curious. I've never heard anybody else mention it. Have you ever heard of a race called the Agarians? No. No. Okay. Not really. I've heard the word, but I wouldn't be able to say anything about them. Do you know where they're from? No idea. No idea. It was just a term, a word that I heard how along. How would you spell that, Mark? How would you spell it? Uh, I think it's A-G-H-E-R-I-A-N-S. I'm going to inquire into that. Not now, of course, but uh, I have um, this guy I was telling you about earlier on who's in contact with a lot of aliens. We're not in contact with the same aliens, actually, so it's really good because we can be... Uh, we can all chip in into the alien ball and uh, <laughs> and get information to help one another. So I'll get back to you uh, via messenger if I ever have anything worth anything to tell you. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the these other experiences. Now you 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 seem to have a lot of different things that are going on in your life constantly with downloading of information to learn, your teaching. I mean, uh, you also have upcoming conferences. Could you tell us about where you're going to be appearing? Uh, nothing lined up for the end of the year because I'm working on other projects. But if you have anything, I'm ready. <laughs> Just call me. <laughs> I'm okay. <ready> to come. <laughs> but nothing uh, for next year, I don't know, because at the moment I'm concentrating on a couple of books and other programs I have here. And developing my own channel also in English with all my shows and things and uh, information I want to share with people, so both in French and in English and probably also in Italian. I have projects in Italian too, so that's got quite a lot on my hands at the moment. <laughs> now, um, but any, anybody who wants me, who wants to have me, I'm ready. <laughs> I can do a lot. I can do a lot of things. And I, I really have a lot to share. As I said at the beginning of the show, I really have a lot to share about aliens, about what they do, what we do, what we can do, about what humans can do to communicate with them, and lots of things about all the trainings and things they're they doing for us, and uh, lots of things, really much. So <clears throat> when we reach this ascension, when this ascension comes and lifts us to the next level, you call it a paradise. But what does that actually mean? Um, because one of the things with humanity in our current state, as as messed up as we are, that the uh, we, we we as a as a, a species would like to be challenged, and you know we we learn sometimes through our own adversity. We learn through through some of the negative things in life. That's how we learn. So if we move forward to this next level, um, and I guess I'm looking at this as a third and fourth dimensional person. It's like for me, it's the same thing as looking at uh, when people talk about heaven. Okay, heaven being a paradise, and you know it's perfect, and every when every love and light. Okay, what's to keep us from being bored out of our minds? <laughs> 
<laughs> what en- <laughs> what en- would engage us in those in those situations? Ah, there are so many, but I mean so 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 many things. Uh, first, we're going to be helping people who have not ascended, amongst others. I'm helping a lot of other people at the moment. All all my life, this life, I've been um, helping, healing, assisting people who are on lower planes than uh, humans are, for example, to help them uh, come up to this plane uh, before, uh, and other people who are going to go up to the fifth dimension, fifth di- density or dimension. Uh, when we are there, we it, let, let me try and do it this way. Uh, imagine you're in a company, okay? You're in a company and you're like a ground floor worker and you do manual and basic tasks and duties. And then you go through training, you evolve, and suddenly you become the supervisor of your own team. And then suddenly new duties. Uh, um, are coming to you, you have new responsibilities, you have a higher vision uh, of the company, of the whole picture, maybe not the whole picture, but a higher of the whole picture, a bigger share, a bigger portion, if you like, of the whole picture. And then you become a boss. So again, you go up, uh, you're trusted to more confidential things and you're given new duties, you're given new assistance. This is probably the the easiest way to show you but except we're going to be moving in different bodies which are not going to be physical bodies we're not going to be needing to eat anymore we're going to have a great expansion in all our senses and develop new senses we're going to have one more uh dna um thread etc etc which all this we're not going to have uh, any diseases or anything because we won't need them anymore. And we're going to be helping other people. So how would is that... that, is, that is, is, is that clear? Or, uh... Well, let me ask, how does that differ from dying? When we die and shed this mortal body and our spirit, soul, whatever you know, moves over to that other spiritual plane of existence. And some people, you know, well, well, there's two questions there. You know, some people are in that spiritual plane doing a lot of what you're describing already. So what's the difference between the living in the fifth dimension and living on a spiritual plane? And will there still be a need for reincarnation after the ascension? Right. Yes, there are many questions there. Let me first go back to my corporate pyramid, maybe, and then uh, we'll take it from there. Um, when we move up, can you repeat the beginning of your first question, Mark? So I'm sure I'm... I'm well, I wanted to know correctly. what the difference is between living in the fifth oh, the dimension and, and being a spirit on and the death. spiritual plane. Okay. Um, when you go through death, death, death does not exist, in fact. Our body dies not our soul. Our soul continues experiencing and experimenting with new things and continuing learning, developing, maybe, like I said, going back to the drawing board in some cases because we haven't learned enough. Some people just go, karma can be repeating and repeating and repeating, can be so repetitive and just doing the same things over and over again. This is why karmic regression, we talked about this earlier on in the show, it's very important because when we regress into a past life, we learn we learn what went wrong, and through learning, we understand what went wrong and we evolve. We find um, our past lives, whoever we were, wherever we were, whatever we were, whatever system, whatever form, whatever substance or immaterial condition we were in. But in any case, um, we go through all these motions. But this is only the soul experimenting things. Uh, when we better in one thing, we go up to the next level. Uh, it can be through reincarnation, uh, another, another incarnation, because we need to continue from where we left off, for example, or we need to revisit some things of the past, or, for example, to live something we lived but did not finish with a partner or with people. So we have to go back to that and set the record straight and um, the right things. 
um, that's part of the karma, but karma is no obligation. Some people who are really, really high in incarnation, in vibration, in spiritual forms, come back down and reincarnate only because they come back down to help people go through certain motions, whatever those people need. But just only as a system to help them. This is why we have our guides and our guardian angels. They come back down to help us. We need, this is another, this could be the, um, the subject of a complete whole other show, actually, but just to cut a long story short again, those uh, contacts, our guardian angels, our guides, they are here because they also need to experience material life through us and through helping us. We must work with them. We must partner and work with them. And they will work with us and they will always be there. I talked about Virgin Mary earlier on. She's doing that. That's one of the things she doesn't need learning, but she's also doing that because she's reached that stage. Uh, she, she's just everywhere all the time. So we can call her um, and call on her anytime. And she will always be there and always on. To. This is why meditation is very important. This is helping us raise our vibration. And by doing that, we also get in touch, in contact with all those people, interact better, faster, further with them. Does that answer your question, Mark? In a way, in a way. I mean, I'm still okay, trying... What's, what's the next one? <laughs> well, <laughs> we, we only have about two minutes left of the, in the show here. Um, okay. So I'm just trying to think, what, what else can I ask you that we could squeeze in here to the last two minutes? Um, the, it, they're, we're, they're trying... These aliens are trying to help us... They're trying to help us ascend. It's happening now. So what is the best for for those people who are becoming aware, like you know, like myself? I mean, I'm, I'm open to it. I'm listening to it. Haven't had any of my own experiences. You know, what advice would you give to somebody like me who's very interested in this and wants to, you know, move forward with it? Okay. Uh, first, let me set the record straight. They are not trying to help us. They are actually helping us. And they are really busy, I can tell you. And people like me, we are really busy. Uh, what can we do? What can you do? Is that what you said? Yes. To, to, to get more out of it? Well, like I said before, be of service to others. We can do, you can do meditation. You can do training. I do lots of training. You can do all sorts of things to learn about yourself, about spiritual life, about um, raising your vibrations, about um, lots of things. Start with that. You know, when people say, okay, look, Jesse, um, I really want to get into this. I said, okay, what do you do? I do nothing. I know nothing. I said, okay, well, why don't you start with meditation? Get into the motion. Set your own calendar um, by which you're going to be doing meditation one way or another every day. It doesn't need to be long. It doesn't need to be formal. Then you can do meditation. You can do prayers. You have to be in contact with nature and animals. And those animals have got to be free. Sorry, Irene. <laughs> and they, you, we have to interact with them. And my, my friends are always, yesterday I was out and there was a, a ladybird who came and stayed on me. And she wouldn't go until I, after like one hour she played on my hands and etc. Because I had this contact with them. They just come to me. It's the same with ants. I don't know why. Jesse, you know, um, I'm going to have to unfortunately cut you off there. We have run out of time. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's quite all right. That's quite all right. Well, it's <laughs> this has been a very informative and interesting show for tonight, and I want to thank you it's for coming great on. To be on the show. It's been great to be um, on the show. I just um, want to mention to everybody, our guest tonight has been uh, Jesse Crenu, and uh, we're talking from Paris. From Paris, from Paris. yes. Uh, and Jesse, uh, we want to thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me, and uh, check my books, contact me. You, I, I normally answer when people contact me on Facebook. Uh, okay, and, just, um, Jesse, just quick, Jesse, quickly. Your books, are they on Amazon? They're on Amazon. One of them is called Umadon in English. The other one is called Raising Atlantis. Okay, yeah, just, 
Right, Jesse, you're on my friend's page on Facebook. In the yep. messaging, if you could just put the names of the books, I'll put him into the promotion. I will certainly do. Thank you, Irene. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, well, well, thank you uh, again, Jesse, and thank you everyone for tuning in to another edition of the Paranormal UK Radio Show here on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. And uh, we will, uh, that's it for this week. So, everyone, have a great week, everyone and we will week. catch you all next time. Catch you all next time. I- Irene, I hope, I hope your uh, ribs feel better. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.